Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special podcast from the Thoughtful Gamer. I am here today with Adam Rayberg from Adam's Apple Games, who is going to be talking about the new game that he is publishing called Thrive, which uh, is just in time after our abstract month because it is an abstract game. Thanks, Adam, for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Mark. Uh, Super excited to be here. Awesome. So tell me about Thrive. The pitch you sent me said that it is uh, an abstract game kind of inspired by uh, games like Onitama, where your play options develop and change over time. Absolutely. The game is definitely inspired by like the Duke, Onitama, and Go. And what's super interesting about it is you have it's a capture game. So you're trying to capture your opponent's pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you move your piece and your movement options are based on a grid of peg holes on each piece. Each piece has a center peg that represents where the piece is on the grid and every other peg on the piece represents where you can move to. So you move a piece, you place two pegs, and that now unlocks new movement op- options for that piece or, or any other piece that you place a peg in on future turns. So you really, really scale and, and increase the amount of movement options you have because you're kind of powering up the piece as you go. Basically like a build your own or design your own chess piece kind of game. Yeah, so you have to actually utilize the piece first before it can be developed. You can't sit there and develop kind of pieces on your back rank that you haven't moved at all. Correct. And that that is what makes the game fast um, because it's, you know, it's a 20 minute, 25 minute game um, on average. And you just you start out and you can only go forward. You're a pawn in chess. You have forward progress only. Now, mm-hmm. you can move backward in the game, but you need to place pegs to be able to do so. So every time you're placing a peg, it's a, such a valuable resource that is that the pe- is that the placement and the choice you want to make? Or do you want to be setting up uh, a capture, a potential capture, or a potential defense of one of your pieces? You say it's a capture game. Is it is it like chess in that there is a king that needs to be captured in like one piece in particular? It uh, it is not. Each piece is uh, the same as it when they start. And your your peg placement will change the pieces as they go. But um, to win the game, you need to whittle your opponent down to one piece. So if, if your opponent ever has one, they lose. Okay. You know, I've played a lot of abstract games in the last, uh, especially in the last month, and I'm curious what the kind of learning experience is for the game in terms of developing strategy, like. Ah, obviously your first play is to move a piece forward and then, you know, open up the options. But in demoing the game and in showing the game off, have you seen kind of trends in how emergent strategies form, or at least within the the specific players? Yeah. So the learning and the strategy development are two different things, right? Like learning the game is one minute. It Sure. People can sit down and just get into it. And that's what makes it so approachable. But where I think people's minds really start to work and really start to formulate these ideas and strategies and, and the fulfillment comes is, is as you learn the game, as you play and experiment and try different things, people are coming up with some really, really interesting techniques. So for me, it like... I've seen players that the the initial trap for the first player is they're they're gonna try to like want to power up one piece and make it super powerful and all the resources are invested in one spot and it's hopping around flying around but as soon as it needs to make a tough decision a decision where it needs to capture an opponent and potentially face being captured itself well now all those resources are squandered so very very often that second game players try to spread out pegs a little more evenly be, between their pieces so that when one piece is captured, they lose less resources. Um, so that's just one of the one of the ways that I've seen strategies develop. You know, as this game progresses, like I probably played it now 40, 50 times, and I still don't necessarily have like an opening turn move sequence that I that I go to. Like I read the board. I always have to read the board because whatever your opponent is doing is so uh, impactful to what my next decisions are. Yeah, because it seems like if you if you start with kind of developing one piece and giving it tons of options, that it can capture stuff pretty quickly it can it, you can even like infiltrate the back line if you want i mean you can jump pieces uh with this movement because mm-hmm. you know you can place a peg that one thing i should mention too is the grid on the piece is a five by five grid the board is a six by six so if you have pegs in the corners uh peg holes of your piece it basically can get anywhere it wants to go on the board it's got some pretty incredible movement capability so you know that piece can be flying around the board pretty quick strategically that may not be that smart because i think you want to keep pieces closer to other pieces so that you can set up some of these chain reactions that are going to be beneficial in your favor right looking at the game here it has this you know it's called thrive it has this kind of flower look to it 
I was curious if that was the theme from the beginning for the game, or is that something that was added on later? Because usually, you know, sometimes with abstracts, you don't see any theme at all. Yeah, this was a this was a, a publisher decision for sure. So I I met the game designer uh, Martin Grider at a pro spiel. He he brought out kind of a, a homemade handcrafted prototype, wooden pieces uh, of plywood, sanded down and drilled uh, twenty five you know holds by hand basically i think he maybe used a jig but it was a very raw prototype it didn't have a theme it its name at the time was eigenstate which is i think a kind of a physics term having to do with you know multiple states of electrons or multiple positions or states of electrons so it's it's kind of a complicated very abstract thing to think about and probably fit the game's uh, abstract nature very well when i took this game on i took it because the gameplay was wonderful the learning curve was was really elegant and the componentry was pretty stunning to look at um, and very unique. Um, but but what I what I like in my abstracts, I like to be able to look at something beautiful as well. So we were looking for a theme that we could do use some artwork to to kind of do that justice. What ended up resonating was a random Google search was I, I typed in like, hey, things with holes in them. That could be dangerous. You're, you're gonna find yeah, it could be dangerous. <laughs> But what came up, safe search, what, safe search on. Safe search is definitely on. But what, what came up halfway down the page was a, a seed pod for a lotus. And so this seed pod, um, it's basically like kind of a, like a gnarly looking, um, a bunch of holes in a flower pod. And the seeds are really big, but it looks interesting as heck. And so that was where that I, I connected the, the dots between like the lotus theme and the game pieces and Thrive. Um, and ever since, we've been so excited about the theme. Your piece grows and it just feels organic. It kind of brings the art we've, we've put on the game kind of brings a little bit of a zen-like feel to the abstract game category, which I, I think is kind of good from an approachable nature. I mean, a lot of times abstracts can be very cold and minimalist. And and this one to me is like there's a fountain on in the background and I'm, you know, just relaxing. And and you also have kind of the the visual pun, I guess, of the pieces flowering or, and growing as as the game plays. Absolutely. But I completely agree about the calming visuals. As much as I appreciate, you know, really nice stark abstract games, I find the ones that do make an effort to, I guess, create the kind of mental experience or mental mood uh, that you want in the game to be really nice. Like, have you have you played TAC? Yes. TAC is, I mean, like the, the tagline, right? Like the beautiful game, right? But wow, what a what a stunning, stunning thing to look at and, and even hold and feel. And like, that is what I want my abstract game to feel and be right, like. Yeah. That's yeah, the one. That's the that's what came to mind, right? Even even in kind of the, the cheaper sets of tack, it still tries to create the experience of playing on wood and in very wood focused. Um, For sure. Yeah, right. Which again, it creates that kind of mental mental mood of the game. But I'm looking at the Thrive board right now. It does look beautiful. The fountain, the water imagery is very nice. You mentioned before that you were at a con right now how is how is that going in terms of showing off the game yeah so we're at the local twin cities uh con of the north uh it's going on three days um we have two games uh that we're that we're showing and demoing um and and our demos have been pretty busy so we have sword crafters and we have thrive and people come up to thrive and they say what's this it looks pretty you know it looks really pretty and and the explanation is really interesting and like you can see in people's brains quickly it clicks they say, okay, well, we'll sit down and play one. Players often are just testing the rules of the game, experiencing what, what I can do, what I cannot do, not necessarily trying to find the winning solution. That being said, I did get my butt kicked twice already today, uh, and I played <laughs> it quite a bit. But the most fascinating thing about this is that they're bringing their friends back to play a game again. So they're like, you got to check this out. So I'll see them come back, and they're teaching someone. So the game is marketing itself, which is amazing. Oh, that's got to feel great. Ah, uh, feels great. Yeah, and then uh, Sword Crafters, you said, is the other one? Sword Crafters is the other one. That was our um, kind of our pretty risky, unique game uh, from 2018. It's a three-dimensional form factor. You start with a sword hilt and you build a three-dimensional sword. It is super thematic, but it's also very abstract in nature. And it just it's, it's a looker. You know, you walk by that, by that table and people are holding swords and you're like, what is this game? And when can I join? That's great. Yeah, because, I mean, in terms of a, a publisher, you you have, I'm looking at your BGG page, you have a, a, a couple of, of games published, but you're relatively new. Are abstract games something you're drawn to, or just kind of happened that, that these two games in a row have been a bit abstract? It happened, I would say. As a player, 
that's what I'm drawn to. I know that thematic games are easier to, I would say, get get an audience excited about. So like, for instance, I'm a huge, huge craft beer nut. When that trend hit, I was all about it. We've, you know, been to probably, I don't know, like 100, 200 plus breweries in the US. And, and that was really awesome thing to bring and put that stamp on creating a game and bring it, you know, making a game and actually bringing craft beer industry into the board game world and, and something that no one else has really ever done in at a big scale like this this is a pretty big scale so um there was like 80 breweries in this game super thematic euro and it, it was a lot of fun but as a player i like interaction I, I like a lot of diverse stuff so i mean i i really do also gravitate to our abstracts and it's been where my my mind has been lately you know i've seen like a lot of su- success with like azul um, you mentioned TAC before. That's been a great one. Santorini, mm-hmm. Onitama. I mean, these these games are, I think, the games that we're probably going to be playing 10 years from now. And some of the more thematic ones, maybe not as much. So I, I really like that as a strategy from a publisher standpoint. And they're also very modular too, right? So like, it's pretty easy to come up with a way to expand on how to make a new sword or craft a new sword. Like sword crafting isn't is it really something people do too often? It's more sword forging, but like this is more like, I don't know, like Minecraft or Lego meets sword making. And so you can just, you know, dream up a new fantasy way to uh, add on to that and may- maybe make sure it's thematic as well. Same thing with Thrive. I think Thrive, we've already started to plan what's the life of the product uh, in the game. And so on Kickstarter, um, one super cool thing is we're going to be throwing in an expansion just for free. And the expansion is again, very much inspired by Onitama and adds a really new and fascinating way to play the game as well. So um, we're not going to release that to the hobby, uh, the distribution right away. So just just a, a, a reason to to support someone trying to do something cool. Do you have a date for when that Kickstarter will be going? Yeah, uh, February 26th. So it's a, it's a Tuesday, it's end of February, and it'll be up for about 24 days. Great. That should be soon after this podcast is actually published. We're recording this a little bit before then, but that is something to look forward to. This game looks super interesting. In terms of your experience with board games, how did that begin? When did you first get into modern board gaming? Modern board gaming was actually uh, introduced to me by my parents. So I've been oh, a gamer cool. my whole life, but PC and and console gaming mainly through throughout college. College the, the the career took took focus, and I stopped for maybe three or four years. Got back into console and PC, um, but one day the parents came home with Carcassonne, and they said, "You got to try this game. Like it's we've been playing it with our friends that are retired, and you know it's a ton of fun." And I'm like, oh, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, okay." Uh, and sure enough, like. That game, it really made an impact on me. And to this day, our family uh, still has a cutthroat Carcassonne game pretty much every time we, we, we meet up. You're the third person in Rono who's, who's where Carcassonne was their, with their entry point into the hobby. Yeah, it's, it's got such a, you know, such a good balance of like long game strategy and short term tactics. And it has depth to it, which I think is, is really cool. And it's mm-hmm. very approachable. So I think, I think it is the kitten caboodle. Like that is, that's my, one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a perfect entry point. It's it's such an elegant, lovely game. And then you mentioned before your your design from a couple of years ago, Brew in USA about craft beer. Did you start thinking about designing and, and publishing a game soon after you got into modern board games, or was there a long time of kind of playing and before that design itch hit you? It was it was soon. It was very quick. Um, I, at the time, I was actually working on some. Uh, iOS app development. So working on like mobile games and stuff and learning how to code. And that was really tough. And I still do that every once in a while, but not as uh, not as much anymore. More of my focus is more the, the tabletop now. Mm-hmm. And what was interesting was that it was hard to iterate when you had to learn art, graphics, sound, coding. It's hard to iterate on the game design very quickly. And so I brought it to the tabletop. And I said, well, how would how would this game play on the tabletop? And then after that, I really started, you know, just thinking it every day, every night. Like I literally for for two years straight would, you know, be we would be on a walk with my wife and we'd be like, hey, do you want to hear my game today? And she's like, another one. Like, come on. <laughs> so it uh it it has kind of consumed me. You know, I, I consume everything and anything game design related these days and I'm, I'm also an avid fan of games out there as well so it's not just about creating it's about playing as well so running a meetup group these days just you know spreading the hobby mm-hmm. what are some of your favorite games right now right now azula's got to be top of the list right now 
Um, I'm looking back to my game shelf because that's how it always works. Yes. Sakatsu. That's a good Um, one. And so I would also pull some inspiration from, oh, Five Tribes is is fantastic. Castles of Burgundy, the dice game. Yeah, I don't know. There's it, it, all, all of the above, but we, 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 we try to learn a new one like once a week kind of thing. And through the meetup group, it's been really easy to do that because I just bring it and teach it. Yeah. And if we like it, we'll, we'll play it again. And if not, it'll sit on the shelf for a while. But um, it's been a, it's, I mean, it's, it's always a fun hobby because you're always learning new stuff. It's just like great to be testing and, and expanding your brain, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In terms of uh, your publishing company now, so you designed Brew in USA and you self published that. Is that something that you're excited about just from the get go in terms of your design was doing the, going the self publishing route, or did you consider sending the design to be published by some by a different company? It was. It was self publishing 100%. This game had a stint with the Tabletop Deathmatch, uh, which is a Cards Against Humanity game design competition back in 2014, 2015. Mm-hmm. It didn't win, but that. That got me the bug um, that I needed to make this thing for real. At the time, like I, I think I even had a job offer on the table, game design related, and like someone wanted to buy it from me, and and I was like, you know, those offers all sound great, but I trust myself to make this thing, and I can do it on my own timeline, and I can make sure I have the creative control. The graphic design was pretty much all all done, and I wanted to make make darn sure that those breweries got into the game. So that was my vision all along. And after that, it was really interesting because like it sat for six or nine months. And I, I said, well, what do I want to do with this? Do I want to, you know, it's really hard to, you know, as, as a publisher with one game, it's really hard to grow your business or expand or get into distribution or make partners, you know, all that kind of thing. Like like doing the things that publishers with a line of games are able to do, it's really tough to do with, with one game. So Game number two came along and I said, okay, this one is from another designer and it'll be cool to work with someone else, kind of bring their dream to life. I really like found my passion as a publisher, I think, working with uh, the uh, the designer on Truck Off and having a second voice and having, you know, someone that can bounce ideas and bounce, um, you know, thoughts and marketing and, and rule book uh, lingo and all that back and forth. So it's really been Getting like surrounding myself with the right people that you know has has really solidified my my passion for publishing. Um, Brewing USA was the first passion project, but now they're all my babies and and my passion projects, right? Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. It's something I, I I really can't comprehend is really getting into the publishing or getting into publishing that enthusiastically because that's co- so completely against my own personality. So I find this very interesting. Like you said, it's a little bit tough when you have just the one project did you find though kind of the entry point like you said getting contacts with distributors and figuring out all the small details that you need to know to publish a game did you find that challenging are there a lot of resources out there yeah there, there's it, it's challenging you have to be a, a jack um like a swiss army knife you have to kind of know how to do everything uh reason reasonably well to be able to do it and then in terms of information and like who to contact and how to how to grow beyond your small bubble of you know just your game and where does the game go after it has had a kickstarter market like this is a big challenge right um i found that th- there are resources out there but there's no one silver bullet to getting into distribution. There's no one silver bullet to finding the right partners to work with in the industry. There are some some good helpers. So like Indie Game Alliance is one that that I would shout out to. We started working with a company now called uh, Double Exposure Envoy, which not sure if that's going to pan out, but they're a marketing division that essentially is a street team for your games, um, which is pretty cool. And they, they have a, a like uh, contact list of uh, you know many heralds that they that help demo games for smaller publishers and, and do that kind of across the U.S. where I can't clone myself 50 times and have an atom in every state. So that's been really cool. And then yeah, I, I, I think it's just keeping your ears open, adding adding value. You know more than taking value from people. And people in this industry are so nice, and so just like network with them and, and ask questions. But it's keep in mind it's also very competitive and but, but friendly competition. You know, just like a lot of really awesome products come out every year, so it's hard to be noticed these days. Right. Yeah. It's great that there are people like you who can kind of jump into that because again, like man, I, I I already have decided that whenever, if ever, I get a game 
design actually to the point where it's not horrific that I am immediately going to find a publisher to do all that work for me. <laughs> that's, that's a, it, it is a, it is a viable and, 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 and smart decision. And one that will, you know, me have much less stress in your life. Is what I'd say. Oh, I'm sure. Um, yes. So what, one other thing that I, I would mention too. So as a small publisher and kind of an indie publisher and like a kind of a team of like one to one and a half at times, I try to document the things I'm doing and we actually have been um, trying to add add value back to the industry. So if you have a game design, we have a we have a, a platform where you can pitch it to us and we can give you feedback real time on it and uh, broadcast that to other people. So shoot it over when you're ready, Mark. It'd be great. Sure. <laughs> we'll do. I, I awesome. haven't found the time to do any designing lately, but I will I will remember that. I think that's all the questions I had. Thrive, like you said, is going to be on Kickstarter, you said, on the 26th? 26th, yep. 26th of February, just in a few days, so be sure to check that out. It does look very neat. The little square pieces with the pegs in them it certainly ignites the imagination. I'm very curious to try out this game. Thanks again for coming on the podcast and telling us about Thrive and your experience being a newer publisher in the industry. My pleasure, Mark. And thanks so much for having me. It's been great. Of course. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. If you'd like to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. By helping us out there, you can get all kinds of cool benefits, including being able to watch our main podcasts being streamed live as well as get on our discord channel where we talk about games all the time uh don't forget to rate and review this podcast on itunes we will talk to you all again soon goodbye